Thanks very much, Jeff, for that uh, flattering introduction. I hope I can live up to the, to the hype. Um, uh, so, uh, uh, as Jeff said, uh, I'm here uh, as a member of the uh, Scientia Educational Academy um, to uh, discuss uh, the elements of the Scientia Education experience relating to assessment and feedback, but also to uh, bring forward an, an aspect of that experience which is underrepresented, I think, in the literature and in, in general, and that is humour. So that's me, uh, a little bit washed out and a little bit hiding there. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but there are, uh, there's a bunch of uh, uh, 15 of us uh, who are dedicated to advancing education and, and a number of us are here today and I, I thank them, those members of the Academy for being here as well. And uh, uh, I'm very grateful for this opportunity to speak to you today. So uh, you are able to interact with me online uh, during this talk. If you have a, a, a web-enabled device, uh, go to www.zetings.com slash Gary V and you'll be able to participate in the polls and other interactive activities in this talk. You might be wondering why I put an x-ray here as the first slide for today. I just thought that we might introduce something vaguely humorous to start with. Um, uh, there is also a funny bone down here. So, I'll, I'll be starting uh, a discussion predominantly of humour just for the first part of this talk. So, I want to start with the, the health benefits of laughter. Being from the medicine faculty, I'm very interested in, in uh, health benefits. So, humour can be addictive. It, it stimulates the brain's reward pathways just like uh, drugs of addiction. It increases the level of endorphins in our bloodstream, the feel-good hormones. It reduces levels of stress hormones. And there, by doing that, it may help to improve immune function. Not only that, uh, it's thought that regular mirthful laughter might decrease the risk of developing some chronic diseases or even ameliorate chronic diseases. And uh, in one study, it's been shown that, that uh, laughter can decrease the need for analgesia during surgery. So humour and, and mirthful laughter is a powerful uh, uh, means of, of improving health. So before we go any further, if you've, if you've logged into Zetings, I'd like to get your impression about what you believe humour is. Just in a few words, what, what you think humour actually is. We often talk about it, but we don't really define it. Sorry? It's www.zetings.com slash Gary V. Thank, thank you to whoever did that. Uh, tragedy plus time, I like that. I've seen that one before. Okay, so, so there's, there's a general theme there that it's something that makes people laugh. But I guess the, the issue is what is, exactly is it that makes us feel that something is funny and that, and that we'd like to laugh, laugh at it? So... Oh, puns, I like that as well. Well, that's, that's true also. The, the, uh, the sender might not intend to be funny, but, uh, but the audience might indeed find it funny. So let's now move ahead, hopefully, and look at a definition that's been generally agreed on by academics. The communication of multiple incongruous meanings that are amusing in some manner. So it's, it's the resolution of incongruity that in the, in the receiver of the humour that, that uh, causes a, relief, a release of tension and, uh, and the uh, expression of laughter. So uh, when we intentionally uh, try to be humorous, we are 
projecting something either physically or, uh, or uh, verbally or other, in other means or visually, something that is in some way incongruous and the resolution of that incongruity might lead to, to laughter. So I'm very interested in how we can better use humour in education. Um, there's been a lot of uh, literature about this, but it's, uh, most of the studies in, in uh, humour are, are quite old. So there's, there's been very little recent work in this area. We know that from those previous studies that appropriate humour, which means humour related to the subject matter that is being taught, and humour that is affiliative, that is humour that doesn't disparage people, humour that brings people together rather than denigrates others. That sort of humour may enhance learning because it helps to maintain attention, it reduces anxiety by building social cohesion, it increases students' participation and motivation, and the, the theory of how it might actually enhance learning is that the the effort required by students to resolve the incongruity in the humour means that they have to engage in processing. And, that, and if they happen to get the, the, the joke and they, and they, and they uh, uh, laugh at it, that, that effort that they've put in uh, is able to be extended to the other concepts that are being, uh, being put forward by that teacher. So uh, affiliative humour increases rapport. Uh, a, a very well-known researcher in this area, Burke, said that there's a good, very good reason to introduce humour into your teaching, and that is that there's a big gap between you and your students in age, in, uh, in social status, uh, in income, uh, in cholesterol levels. Um, and this is one way of bringing people together, getting them all on the same level. And the other reason he said that it's good to introduce humour is that it, it brings a potentially dull subject, he was a teacher of statistics, uh, to life. Um, humour may help students to cope with stress. And interestingly, interestingly, it correlates positively with students' ratings of teaching. So uh, if for no other reason, you might want to try it. Um, now, uh, there's been some very interesting studies of of uh, controlled studies of humorous lectures versus non-humorous lectures by the same person to the same group of students. And they've shown that there is an optimum number of humorous uh, attempts in an hour of lectures. Um, and uh, uh, with that optimum number of, of attempts, uh, it's been shown that, that uh, learning can improve, can, can be shown to have been improved up to six weeks after such lectures. So, so there is some, uh, some good motivation to get involved with this. However, as I've mentioned, disparaging humour or humour that denigrates or socially isolates students can have exactly the opposite effect. So it needs to be used very carefully. So, let me go back. So I'm going to uh, give you an example of humour that, that I use to exemplify a concept. So this is uh, uh, a story that I tell in relation to the appropriate use of diagnostic investigations. An elderly woman comes to a vet's office and she's carrying a cage with her and at the bottom of that cage is a bird lying motionless. She, she is very emotionally upset and she, she begs the vet, please can you help my bird? And the vet says, I'm sorry, madam, it looks like your bird is dead. He said, well, you haven't actually examined it properly. Can you maybe do something else? He says, very well, madam. He goes back into his office. He comes out with a beautiful Siamese kitten. The Siamese kitten leaps up onto the bench, sniffs around the cage, looks up sadly, much like this, and says, meow, indicating that... Uh, according to the vet, that this, uh, this is uh, a dead bird. But the elderly woman still won't accept this. She says, look, it's only a cat. Can't you do something else? Very well, madam. Takes the Siamese kitten away, comes back with a beautiful Labrador puppy. 
Puppy puts his feet up on the bench, sniffs around, looks up sadly, you can see the tears in his eyes, and the vet says, look, I'm sorry, this confirms your, your bird is in fact dead. And the elderly woman finally accepts the diagnosis and she says, very well, uh, what do I owe you for your trouble? He says, $500. $500 for telling me my bird is dead? She says, well, madam, I wouldn't have charged you at all, but with the CAT scan and the lab tests, Um, so this is meant to, uh, uh, to get people to think about the, uh, the appropriate use of investigations. All right. So have I motivated you at, at all? If, if you have the chance, would you use appropriate humour to enhance your students' learning? Give that a rating. Looking positive. Very good. So, a bit worried about that lacking half star, but you can't have everything. So, uh, so I think uh, the people in this room are on board with the concept that that humour might be helpful for learning. All right. So, moving on from humour. Uh, one of the important elements of the Scientia education experience is, is assessment and, in particular, giving and receiving feedback uh, via assessment. So, assessment is troublesome. It costs a lot of effort from the point of view of the academic and it costs a lot of stress from the perspective of the student. So, why bother with it? Why do it? Well, there are several reasons for it, and one of them is that it actually encourages people to learn. Um, and, very importantly, it can help to provide feedback on the students' learning and on our teaching. Um, then there are the uh, administrative sides of assessment, the need to document competency, uh, certification for professional practice and benchmarking. But I think if, uh, when we, when we took, if we take 100 students and we ask them what, the, what is their uh, curriculum, they will, uh, they will tell us that, most of them will tell us that it is the assessment requirements that, that uh, determine their curriculum. And therefore, we need to be very careful and, uh, and intentional on, as to how we utilise assess assessment. So, the problem is that we have a lot of students who are stressed out, who are anxious, who are depressed, who are suicidal. A recent study in the Journal of the American Medical Association uh, uh, surveyed medical students worldwide and they found that more than one quarter of them at any one time are depressed and more than 10% of them had suicidal ideation. Now, you might think, well, that's medical students, they're under a lot of pressure. Maybe that's true, but law students are pretty similar and other students in other disciplines are not far behind. So we have a major problem. We have a lot of very uh, unhappy and, uh, and stressed students. So what do students want from assessment? They want clear expectations. They want to know what it is that they need to achieve. They want timely feedback that they can act upon in order to improve. They want authentic tasks which align with their idea about what they might be doing once they graduate. Real world tasks. And they want some choice and flexibility in their assessment. So those are things that we should take on board when developing assessment tasks. There are also some uh, measures we can take to reduce students' distress in relation to assessment. Um, we can provide them with the appropriate guidelines and criteria for assessment, such as rubrics, uh, and make sure that they're clearly understood by our students. Uh, we can provide worked examples of high standard work to show students what they can aspire to do uh, without, of course, copying it word for word. Um, we need to give students opportunities to practice their skills. And, uh, and this is where formative assessment is very important. And the, uh, and once, when they practice their skills, we need to give them appropriate feedback to help them improve. And at a 
at a broader level, we need to improve students' understanding of their own thought processes, their metacognitive abilities, and their ability to regulate their own learning. So, in your practice, which one of these reasons is most important to you for providing students with feedback? It's a very interesting, interesting set of figures. Um, clearly, uh, providing opportunities for improvement is the, is the leader, um, with some, uh, some support for motivating students to engage with the course, very little support for feeding forward and improving ratings. I don't know if that's entirely, uh, entirely uh, the truth for most people, but maybe just for the audience here. And I'm glad that somebody uh, voted for reducing psycho uh, psych student psychological distress because it, uh, feedback is a very important part of, of reducing that distress. So, in a, uh, when we, in our assessment practice, feedback has got to be at the forefront of, of our minds when we develop our assessments. So, I guess the other thing to say is that feedback is anything that, can, that a student can use to improve their learning, not just feedback on an assessment task. It's any, uh, any input that they provide and any, any uh, response that, that their peers or, or, us, or we as teachers can provide to them. It's, it's clearly uh, a fundamental aspect of all assessments and we know that, that uh, formative feedback improves learning increases their satisfaction and reduces their distress. Um, in 2005, Krauss and colleagues uh, surveyed a large number of students in first year in Australian universities and found that less than a third perceived that they received regular helpful feedback. That might have improved over the past 12 years, but I suspect that, that we still have a long way to go. So, this is a list of examples of assessments and feedback tools that we use in the Faculty of Medicine. Uh, some of these I've been involved with, some of these I haven't, but there's a long menu there of, uh, of examples of use of feedback. So, some of those will cover in the remainder of this talk. So this is where you get to choose your own adventure. The, the, uh, the uh, element or the feedback strategy that gets the most votes will be the first one that we, we uh, talk about. You can vote for more than one if you wish. Be like Anthony Green on election night. Seems like there's a very, a very high donkey vote here. All right, well, as it so happens, the next slide in my order happens to be on online formative feedback assessments. So this, uh, this wasn't a rigged, uh, a rigged poll, this uh, uh, just happened to work out that way. So, um, I've been involved in uh, online formative feedback assessments for around 15 years now and, and commenced them in the medicine program uh, when it moved to its, its current integrated format starting in 2004. And we have formative feedback assessments embedded in all of uh, the phase one medicine courses. And the questions are based on clinical scenarios, so we tried to make them as authentic as possible. Um, 
and uh, we try to emphasise integration between disciplines. And uh, we published data in 2008 that showed that these assessments had a, a beneficial effect on students' learning um, uh, in terms of their assessment results and also in terms of their, uh, their engagement with the course. So this is a screenshot from one such assessment uh, relating to chest pain, um, showing an ECG, and the student needs to interpret the ECG uh, by selecting from a list. They then need to try to understand what the cause of that abnormality might have been, and eventually um, they're asked to, uh, uh, to understand what the appearances of the tissues look like once, they've, uh, once the person has unfortunately passed on. So these are some student quotes from uh, the online formative feedback assessments. Um, they continue to be very popular with students. These are not uh, mandated, but more than 80% of students uh, uh, undertake these assessments in each course, and usually they do it on multiple occasions. The important thing for them is that whatever they answer, uh, they get uh, remedial feedback on. So the next, um, next thing I'd like to briefly mention is the BEST network, which stands for the Biomedical Edu Education Skills and Training Network. It was a very clever name. I wasn't responsible for it. Because by definition, if you don't belong to this network, you're not really belonging to the BEST network. So um, you can see there, there's, there's a large number of students uh, involved, a lot of them from UNSW, but also from, from uh, uh, universities around Australia. And there's use by academics uh, in various parts of the world as well. One of the aspects of the BEST network is the development of an image repository called SLICE. SLICE has a number of biomedical images, uh, more than 18,500 at the moment, and it enables uh, students and teachers to interact on images by creating annotation layers. Once you create an annotation layer, it, uh, it belongs to you. And you can share that layer with others. So a teacher can share it with their students, students can share it with other students, and teachers can share with teachers so that we can, uh, we can support uh, teaching across uh, institutions. So this is uh, a uh, computer lab in the Wallace Worth building, in the medicine building, where we have uh, students in practical labs. We, we like them to work together uh, on one screen, uh, annotating uh, layers of, uh, of biomedical images. And we've done a study to, to see whether colla uh, collaborative annotation, that is working together, is better than individual annotation for learning. So, uh, we took groups of junior students, intermediate, uh, these were medical science students, and then intermediate medical students, third year medical students, and year six medical students, and we looked at, at their, uh, their understanding of the topic before and after annotation in both individual and collaborative circumstances, and we found a significant difference in favour of collaborative annotation uh, for the senior students only, and that's I think quite interesting because uh, the senior students needed that, that background to feel confident that their, that their peers were giving them the good oil. Um, and, they, uh, um, and so they, they invested more in the information they received via collaborative annotation, whereas there's much less investment from the junior and the intermediate students. However, if you look at their perceptions of understanding, they actually thought that they learned more in all groups by collaborative uh, annotation. So the perception was slightly different from the objective measurement. So the next um, uh, aspect of feedback is this thing called virtual microscopy adaptive tutorials. This is uh, uh, something that was developed on the adaptive e-learning platform developed by Draw Ben Naim when he was uh, a PhD student in the School of Computer Science and Engineering. And he subsequently uh, parlayed that into a, a, a startup company called Smart Sparrow, uh, which, in which he was giving himself a big rap, by the way, because Draw in Hebrew means sparrow. 
who is saying smart rule. Um, in any case, uh, he and I started collaborating in 2008 uh, because we found that students weren't really engaging with microscopic pathology. They didn't really understand what all these blue and pink blobs were. And it was very hard in large practical classes to provide feedback to everybody. So we created these uh, interactive uh, exercises uh, online which students could do in class uh, before classes preparation or after class for revision and uh, they could get immediate remedial feedback on their misconceptions and uh, we've now uh, we use them as formative assessments mostly but we've now uh, uh, used them also as summative assessments of practical uh, class learning in the medicine program and uh, this has led to improved student engagement and learning outcomes. So the, the best thing for teachers about the adaptive e-learning platform is that you can see uh, exactly what the students are doing and what their conceptions are. So uh, the various aspects of this, of, uh, this particular tissue um, are being marked by students and you can see where they put all their, all their markers and you can isolate the individual markers. So this particular uh, aspect, um, a lot of students are correct and those who are incorrect were fairly close. In this one, this is the correct area, not much in there, but a lot all over the place. So that indicates to us that we need to provide a bit more information to the students. Um, and this can actually be done in real time during class. So, um, and we have evidence of significant benefits for learning. So this has now been translated into online practical examinations and these practical examinations, each of them saves us 40 hours in terms of academics marking time. Um, and they also enable us to provide rich feedback to students. Previously, when they were done by writing uh, in an answer book, uh, there was no way we could give uh, individualised feedback. Now we can provide students with, with these maps and show them uh, exactly where the correct areas were and, and, and where they might have been incorrect. And the, the analytics on the SmartSparrow platform uh, help us with the administrative side of things as well. So I'm conscious of the time but uh, we'll keep going for a little while. Um, this uh, is uh, an online knowledge map, which is similar to a concept map uh, where uh, concepts are related to each other by linking phrases, except that uh, concept maps, by definition, have a hierarchy. So you need to uh, order things correctly, whereas knowledge maps are just uh, uh, connections between concepts that don't need to be in any particular order. So, um, we developed an, a system for online concept, uh, online knowledge mapping uh, using funding from uh, University of New South Wales Innovation and Development Grant. And uh, this has enabled us to better uh, provide feedback to students on their integration of concepts. And uh, again, it's led to improved learning outcomes. So, when a student submits their, their knowledge map, it gets compared to the uh, teacher's template map and they get feedback as to which, uh, which concepts uh, don't match the teacher's concept. And you can also score it um, based on an algorithm and it, uh, this could be potentially utilised for summative assessment and it may be a more efficient way than, for example, using, uh, using a brief uh, paragraphs of short answers. So the students are, are pretty happy with this. The, the other aspect of these knowledge maps is that the, the teacher can decide how much to scaffold students uh, in, the, in, their, uh, in their maps. So they can provide a greater amount of scaffolding or a lower amount of scaffolding depending upon the maturity of the students and their, the extent of their understanding of the topic. Okay, uh, the next thing I'd like to talk about is something that uh, has been led by Kristen Herbert in the School of Medical Sciences. Um, he, again with the aid of a Learning and Teaching Innovation Development Grant, uh, flipped 
his, uh, his course, uh, which is an introductory course for year two medical science students in pathology. And uh, instead of using lectures for didactic teaching, um, they were used uh, for integration and feedback sessions. So the student, uh, students uh, use the, the tutorials for case studies and in-class questions. Uh, they participated in the large group teaching via what used to be the active learning platform but is now uh, the Lecture Recordings Plus system at UNSW. And they received feedback tailored to their responses. So these integration and feedback sessions uh, occurred throughout the course and in order to attract students to attend, we provided 5% of the course mark for satisfactory engagement with those sessions. And it actually works. If you give student a mark for doing something, they will generally turn up. Almost Pavlovian in its, uh, in its effect. So this is, uh, I'm sure you've all seen by now what, what uh, the Lecture Recordings Plus system looks like, but this is the sort of, uh, of uh, graph of, of alternatives that a student might see once the answer has been revealed in their interactive feedback session. And 82% uh, of students participate in that session. So that's been very successful and Kristen's further developed the, this aspect of the course uh, alongside a lot of online modules to support students' learning. I'd just like to mention briefly uh, Dr Silas Taylor, who's the head of the clinical skills element in our medicine program, has led the development of uh, something called OSPIA, uh, which is the online simulated patient interaction and assessment platform. So whereas students previously had to do a very laborious assignment where they interviewed a patient, um, and then transcribed their interview and commented on their, on their uh, communication skills. Students can now uh, match their availability with a simulated patient and they can interact online via video conferencing system. Um, there's a very complicated timetabling and registration process that enables this, but once they've, they've interviewed the, the patient, they can later uh, review that, that recording and reflect on their uh, performance. They get feedback from the, the simulated patient and from uh, their tutor. And uh, the, the outputs, including the, uh, the feedback data, can be stored. And not only that, uh, we can analyse the facial expressions and the body language of the, the student to give them feedback on, on the effect of that on their communication. So finally, we come to standards-based assessment, very dry area. Uh, this could be considered to be standards-based assessment because everybody in that lineup is going to get the same chance to climb that tree. Uh, they might not all have the same success though. So utilising a learning and teaching grant, uh, we developed a a method for standards-based assessment in the biomedical sciences within the medicine program. And the reason we did that is because, sorry, I've gone well ahead, um, students have difficulty uh, understanding how, how their knowledge is growing within individual disciplines because our program is completely integrated. So we developed common content standards across the disciplines and performance level descriptors for the biomedical sciences. And we used uh, uh, item response theory to analyse uh, multiple choice items across, uh, across multiple exams, uh, reflecting each student's uh, uh, understanding of their discipline. And we also set boundaries between bands of scores to, uh, to accom uh, accompany the performance standards set by staff. And this led to the development of these feedback reports for students which uh, let them know how they're going in relation to a variety of biomedical disciplines in the medicine program. And students can use this as a, as a spur to improvement. So this particular student uh, has a bit of a problem with microbiology, but uh, generally doing well. So, final question. Of all those things that you've seen today, 
is there anything that you might be able to apply to your own context? Select, you can select any or all of them. With the, there's been some support for all of them. I think we now have the ability within Moodle to, uh, so that anybody can, can uh, implement online formative feedback assessments if they so wish. Um, we have the, uh, we have the uh, Smart Sparrow license for the, for the university, so uh, there is that opportunity to create adaptive tutorials and virtual labs. Um, we're happy to share Slice with whoever wants to use it. Online PRAC exams, if, you, if, they're, uh, if PRAC exams are something that your discipline uses, uh, the online version uh, is much more efficient than the paper-based version. And um, everybody now has access to use Lecture Recordings Plus to, uh, to add some uh, interactivity to their lecture and, and hopefully transform their lecture into something a bit more interactive. And, uh, Standards-based feedback of reports hopefully will become something that are more, more common across the university over time. So, it's the final thought about assessment. Students are worried about what the outcome will be, but so are the staff. So, let's hope that with, uh, with a bit of, uh, of uh, collaborative uh, work and, and goodwill, we can uh, reduce the worries on both sides of that equation. Thank you for your attention today. Thanks, Gary. That was not great. Um, I want to ask you a question. It's something that we were mentioning briefly in a meeting the other day. The question of how we respond to student anxiety. So law students, like med students, very high levels of anxiety. I struggle with this all the time because I think about the fact that law hasn't really changed other than the invention of the internet and continuous assessment. We are teaching much the same material that we were teaching 20 years ago, 30 years ago, and yet our students' anxiety has gone through the roof. Um, and I wonder how a university is meant to respond um, and also whether rather than us changing what we do, we would be better off as universities um, speaking more publicly about the stress that's created for students in the school system because my feeling is by the time we get a lot of students, there's nothing we can do. They've been stressed out of their brains since they were eight and someone told them they had to get into OC. Um, and now with things like you can't sit the HSC unless you do well enough in NAPLAN, um, and I, I'm particularly sensitive to this. I'm midway through my third HSC in six years, so I'm really down on the New South Wales HSC. So I just wonder whether as universities, rather than us trying to change the way we assess, we need to start speaking more publicly to the general public and also the Department of Education to say, you have to stop what you're doing because by the time we get them, there's just, some of them, there's just nothing we can do. It's, uh Thanks very much uh, for that. It's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting uh, problem and, and clearly we can't solve society's issues. But whatever we can do, I think we, we have a moral obligation to do. Um, we know that 18 to 24 year olds have the highest incidence of mental health issues, regardless of whether they're at university or not. But given that they're a vulnerable group, and given that they have been highly stressed in the lead up to their, to their arrival at university, I think it's very important that we take them from a, an environment where they might have been very individually focused. That I, I need to get a mark to get into my preferred course, into a community uh, where they feel supported and, uh, and where they're not competitive but collaborative. I think if, if we, can, we can do that, we, we can't solve the problem, but we can certainly ameliorate it. And probably the, some of the, the, the most uh, classic studies of uh, the effects of collaboration in higher education were done at Harvard uh, in the 1960s when 
uh, rich uh, uh, Anglo-Saxon people were doing very well in a physics course and uh, people who came in on scholarship uh, from poorer uh, socioeconomic backgrounds uh, and African-American backgrounds were doing very poorly. The lecturer got the uh, African-Americans to study together with the, with the uh, Anglo-Saxons, and suddenly the African-Americans were outperforming the Anglo-Saxons. So it's this social isolation that can occur in, in universities is something that, that we can do something about. Thanks, Gary. That was great. Very, very humorous and entertaining, so thank you very much. Um, just continuing the theme, um, you did seem to quote the Melbourne work by Wendy Larkham and um, Chi Bick um, in terms of a whole of university approach to mental health and well-being for students. Um, I'm just wondering what your reaction is to that approach and whether we should be looking at it in terms of a whole of university and not just at medical students or law students or whatever. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Jackie. I, I think that a whole university approach would be, would be appropriate, um, given the scale of the problem and the fact that, that it doesn't, it's not one faculty or another, it's, it's all faculties uh, who, uh, who are affected by this. In the Faculty of Medicine, we are uh, about to appoint a full-time uh, well-being um, uh, advisor or coordinator, and uh, that is something that the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Melbourne has just done, so we're following in their footsteps in that regard. But I think a, a broader uh, approach across the university would probably have an even greater impact, not just for students, but also for staff. Hi Gary, thanks. Can you hear me? Thanks for that. Um, I was thinking about, there was a point on one of your slides that referred to the fact that um, a, a huge number of students don't perceive that they're receiving feedback. And you mentioned, I think, that it was quite an old study and that perhaps things had changed. Um, it's my experience that often, it is very often, particularly when we're giving quite sort of subtle forms of feedback, that students actually don't recognise those things as feedback. And one of the, the little simple strategies that I've used is to use the word feedback a lot um, to sort of trigger in their minds that they're, they're actually receiving feedback. My question really is, um, you're using some amazing uh, different forms of um, assessment and formative uh, uh, opportunities for formative feedback. To what extent do you think the students are actually understanding that this is actually feedback that they're receiving? Thanks, Michelle. Um, it's a good question. There have been some interesting uh, studies done of what happens if you explicitly label something as feedback versus not. Um, uh, and there was a fairly uh, recent study in medicine that showed if you, if you provide uh, feedback on, on a recent uh, assessment item uh, without labelling as feedback, and if you then do the same thing with a, with a similar cohort and say, now this is feedback, uh, suddenly the ratings for feedback in your course go up. Um, now, that may be the case, and, and certainly since we, we started labelling our online formative assessments as online formative feedback assessments, that element of the cat eye and now my experience has improved. However, I think that regardless of how we label it, students are probably correct in their perception that they're not getting what they need. And, and so we, we do need to address, address that issue. Thank you. That gave me a good idea. Maybe we should um, label it, tell the students, I'm doing good teaching now. <laughs> um, I, it was really striking that the 25% of students in medicine and similar number in law and perhaps a bit less in other faculties are depressed at any given instant. Uh, so two, two things. One is, do you have any 
insight or thoughts about that because that's really shocking to me. Uh, that's unexpectedly shocking. And the other thing is, do you, do you think, know of any link between humour and depression or its impact on depression? Thanks, Richard. So, um, first part of your question... Um, sorry, can you repeat the first part? Yeah. Um, maybe we should label our... No, no. <laughs> um, just, do you have any comments about the 25%? Yes. I, I'm, I'm just, I'm really at a loss about it, and I thought you might have some insights as yeah. to why it's there or, or yeah. your thoughts about it. Yeah. Um, the authors of the, the paper in the Journal of the American Medical Association um, cited competitiveness as opposed to collaboration as one of the, as one of the issues, and they advocated uh, moving to non-graded medical degrees uh, because there was a reduced level of, uh, of depression in students in those non-graded medical programs. Um, there are a variety of other issues, including student support and, and, uh, and the, uh, uh, the clinical environments, which are not always as supportive as they, as they could be. Um, the other aspect of your question, humour, uh, and depression, uh, there, there is a little bit of work on that. Um, there, there are these uh, alternative therapies, laughter therapies, etc. Uh, but uh, I'm not sure if there's been a randomised controlled trial of laughter versus antidepressants. Yeah. Very hard to get somebody who is, who is biologically depressed to laugh. Yeah. Um, if somebody's got a situational uh, depression, it might be possible to make them laugh, but if somebody with biological depression, probably laughter is not going to be the answer. But we're thinking this 25% is situational, is that what this is? Yes. It's something we have yes, it, it's with. probably largely situational yeah. depression. So uh, maybe the lunchtime, uh, lunchtime mirth session might be, uh, might be something worthwhile. Thanks, Gary. Um, a related question. Um, maybe out of left field. What percentage of the general population of 18 to 24 year olds who aren't at the university are depressed? Maybe that's 25% too, because they're not a happy bunch out there. We've got plenty of evidence that there's social problems all around. Uh, okay, we're causing some of the problem, but maybe it's not us. Yes, uh, I think maybe Jackie would have better figures on this than I, than I would, but I, I think, yes. So, so just to repeat what Jackie said, for the benefit of the recording, um, the university population does have a significantly greater rate of depression than, than the general population in that age group. <clears throat> Thank you, Gary. This one? Can you hear me? Sorry, um, I wanted to th talk about um, the agency of students in their assessment. Um, I uh, was lucky enough to have a, uh, a lecturer, a professor, who surprisingly at the end of most exams it became a pattern, but the first one was a shock. The very last question was, please write a question and answer it on, the, on some aspect of this course. And... Uh, at that stage, which was, you know, we were only had an exam system. There was very little other than just doing the exams at the end of a eight-week semester. So um, what wiggle room do you think there is for students to have some more agency in their assessment in terms of them being able to provide more input into their assessment, directly or indirectly? Yeah. Uh, thanks, Robert. No, that wasn't a Dorothy Dixon, but, but it, it leads me to mention the reading game, which, which you created. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, for those who don't know, uh, the reading game is is an online uh, uh, collectivist uh, uh, piece of software that enables students to write their own questions and to review each other's questions and to answer each other's questions. Um, and uh, and this can be used to improve learning. In fact, we tried it in one of our phase one medicine courses and found that that cohort performed uh, extraordinarily well in their end of course exam. So, uh, and it's been used in a variety of different disciplines as well. So that, that uh, sort of, the, you don't really, uh, I believe you don't really know something very well until you've taught it to somebody else. So 
getting students to teach each other is a, is a very good way to, to learn and, and that, that may be a way of giving them more agency and assessment. In, we also need to give students choice in wherever we can uh, in, their, in their assessment tasks so that they, they feel that they're doing something that motivates them rather than something that's been imposed on them. You said that um, when the optimum number of humor actions happened in a lecture, there was improvement out to six weeks. Did it stop after six weeks or is that just when they stopped measuring it? Yes, uh, Richard, unfortunately in educational research uh, there is this problem of, of not following up for long periods of time. So uh, I think six weeks was the, was the last time point at which, at which they measured. Um, and, and that's, that's a, ge a general problem with educational research is that there are very few long-term studies. I've just got a question around um, using David Baud's concept of sustainability, sustainable assessment. How we best ensure that we provide feedback that is sustainable? So I think the examples that you've shown, <coughs> most of those have built within them kind of feedback actually built into the system, but that's not always possible. So how do you think that we can provide sustainable feedback? That, that's an excellent question, Lois. Um, sustainable, sustainable assessment is, is one of uh, David Bowd's uh, great contributions to, uh, to the higher education sector. Um, the, the general principle is that uh, our assessment tasks need to develop students' ability to, uh, to reflect on their own learning and to be able to, uh, to understand where they are and how they can, how they can improve. So uh, clearly that puts feedback at the, at the uh, forefront of, of assessment. Uh, instituting uh, sustainable assessment is not always simple, uh, particularly in the humanities, it's, it, it requires a lot a lot of, uh, of effort on the part of the teacher, but uh, use of peers uh, and, uh, and use of self-assessment uh, can, can help to ameliorate the, the overall workload for the academic. Mm. Thanks, Ms. Curry. Um, just when you were talking before about um, uh, um, ungraded assessment or pass-fail assessment, I assume you mean. I mean, I've often thought about that in law. I would love it if we just had pass-fail. Um, how likely, I mean, I know there are law schools that do it, how likely is it we will, that we would be able to do that? I mean, do you think that's something universities could, could go for because it would solve an awful lot of problems for us? Yeah, so I think... <sighs> It's, it's something I've been grappling with with the medical faculty. Um, there are academics who are staunchly opposed to this. There are academics who are very much in favour of, of non-graded passes. But the real barrier, even if, if we could get it through the academic side of things, is that, is that the students feel that they would be disadvantaged if we gave them non-graded passes because they perceive a very competitive environment after their graduation. So. It's very hard for us to act in isolation. We need to, to act with the professional bodies and the sector to, uh, to work in concert to, to reduce the, the stress on students. So once again, we have been privileged to hear from one of our outstanding educators in this uh, series. And I think you'll all agree with me uh, that that was a very impressive display of a diversity of practices uh, that Gary talked about tonight. I think this is one of the things that we need to continue to reflect on is the range of activities that we can do with our students, both in terms of learning, in assessment, the use of feedback, and now, of course, we can add humour to that, uh, which just reminds me that with the, if, I just wonder whether we need to update the centre education experience now um, to actually include humour 
in there as well as one of its domains. And then I shall have to have a talk with the Deputy Vice-Chancellor Academic to say we need to change the My Experience questions now to say, uh, ha perhaps have a question that says, uh, you know, my teacher made me laugh. Um, and we can see what ranking we get on that. Actually, we could do promotion on that too, Gary, I think, yes. So you've given me a lot of things to think about in terms of how we can improve our processes here. But look, once again, let's just thank Gary for an outstanding presentation tonight.